Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Welcome. It's exciting to have this time of worship together and to join in this space. I'm Jeff Ross. I'm one of the pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 35. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any further. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why do you make commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and they went where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talatha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of his word. Don't be afraid. Wow. Wow. There are those words again. Don't be afraid. You know, that's so much easier said than done. Last week we looked at the storm where Jesus said, don't be afraid. This week we look at the health of a loved one where Jesus again says, don't be afraid. Gosh, that's so much easier said than done. You know, I enjoy the work and the preparation uh, for preaching. I enjoy wrestling with the scripture, if you will. I especially like the process of looking at the text historically and traditionally. What have people thought and said over the years? What interpretations do people have about the text and about what happened and about how it happened and what specific verse is more important than the next verse? But I also enjoy sort of digging and, and sitting with, what is this text saying to you and to me today, here in 2021? What is the discovery of the text uh, that God has for you and I in this setting, in this place? So in this process... One of the things that I discovered this week is a, a thing called the 365 fear knots. 
Evidently, it's a, a thing on the internet and places like Pinterest uh, where there's 365 verses that talk about fear not. So that's one for every day of the year. And that's exciting, isn't it? Because we all are fearful. We all struggle with being afraid. And so if we had a verse every day to reinforce uh, the hope that we need to have as we live, uh, that'd be a wonderful thing. It would be a wonderful thing if it was true, but it's not. Sadly, the 365 things, uh, 365 fear nots is actually a thing. You can find it everywhere posted as if it was true, but it's not. There are many, many verses uh, and stories in the Bible that talk about not being afraid, but there's not 365 verses that say fear not. There's only about 150 or so. Actually, this 365 fear not is a, is a made-up thing that, that sort of profits off of the fear industry. The fear industry. Is there really such a thing? Well, evidently there is. Uh, there's a, a list that I ran across as well that talked about the top 25 industries that profit from fear. In the top three are politicians, insurance, and believe it or not, religion. Fear is a huge business. If we can create a way for you to be afraid, then we can profit from that. We can get you to buy something. We can get you to, uh, to buy a bunch of things. There's a, a, a phrase that's used in, in marketing or in an acronym, uh, FUD, F period, U, period, D, period, that stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And FUD is a propaganda tactic uh, used in sales, marketing, public relations, politics, polling, and cults. FUD is a strategy to influence perception by disseminating negative and even false information as an appeal to fear. Uh, People have figured out ways to, to market research and figure out what you're most afraid of and then hit you with something that hopefully will alleviate that fear and they can make money and you can maybe feel a little less fearful. The stock market strategists have long encouraged people to buy the fear. You know, profiting from fear isn't anything new at all. In fact, it's active uh, all through the Bible, especially in our scripture passage today. So let's look at that. Let's look at this passage. We're first introduced to Jairus, the child's father, back in verse 22 of this fifth chapter. He comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to come with him because his daughter is sick and he wants Jesus to heal her. And this is fascinating. He actually gets down on, on a knee uh, to beg Jesus to come. And this is fascinating because Jairus is introduced as one of the leaders of the synagogue. Now at this point in Jesus' ministry, the synagogue and Jesus are, are butting heads. Uh, they're not getting along at all. Uh, in fact, publicly, the synagogue is saying that Jesus is a quack. Don't listen to him. Don't follow him. They're trying to find ways to keep him quiet, uh, to arrest him even. And so it's fascinating that Jairus, when his daughter is in trouble, comes to Jesus and not his fellow uh, leaders of the synagogue. Um, and so he, he comes to Jesus to ask for help. Now, we pick the story back up in the 35th verse uh, as they are beginning or in process of walking to Jairus' house. And some folks meet them on the way and tell Jairus, and Jesus overhears, that the daughter has actually died. And so, wow, uh, what, would you, what would you do in that sort of situation? It, it would be hard to control your emotions. But Jesus grabs Jairus and quickly tells him, don't be afraid. Gosh, that, that's really hard to stomach. Don't be afraid. You're, you've just been told that your daughter has died, 12 years old. Um, 
I, I, don't, I don't know how Jairus could not be afraid, but you see Jesus trying to guide him, to lead him, to keep him positive, to keep him with an open mind. He says to Jairus, don't be afraid, only believe, continue to believe. Jairus has already shown faith in Jesus by coming to him, uh, even though he knows this might get him in trouble with the other leaders of the synagogue, but he comes to Jesus, so he's demonstrating a faith, a belief uh, that Jesus actually can do something. Uh, And and so uh, Jesus wants to nurture that. He wants to grow that. He wants to uh, help that uh, bloom and blossom into something greater. So he tells Jairus, don't be afraid. Continue to believe. It's almost as if Jesus is pleading with him. So they continue on to the house. And when they get to the house, it says there's a loud commotion. Uh, And this is where people in Jesus' day profited from fear. There would have been paid uh, whalers and musicians and people there. There would have been folks there wailing loudly, trying to wail louder than others. It was a competition. Uh, So maybe they would get hired to be a whaler uh, the next time somebody had a a tragic event. Uh, Fear was big business even in Jesus' day. And Jesus tries to tell them that the child is not dead, she's only asleep. And and do you see what it says when Jesus says that in verse 40? It says they laugh at him. They laugh at Jesus uh, having any hope at all. They laugh at the idea of hope. They laugh at the idea of healing. They laugh at the idea that this could be anything but a fearful, tragic event. You know, I, I wonder, is it easier to, to fear than it is to have hope? Uh, is it easier to live in fear than it is to live in faith? And that's, I think, at the heart of the question and the struggle that Jesus is trying to, to get at and, and that Mark is trying to get at as he tells this story. Think about your own situations. Uh, which has been easier, uh, to have faith or to, uh, to cave in to the fear that is all around us. You know, this hit home for me a few years ago. Our, our, our middle daughter, Amy, uh, was working in a retail store. And part of her job from time to time was to take the money bag at the end of the day uh, and take it to the bank uh, before the bank closed and put it in the bank drop drawer. And uh, so on this particular day, Amy uh, checked the money with the store manager, signed off on it, took the bag, and she did this alone, uh, which was the policy with the, with the store. She got in her car by herself, went to the bank, uh, rolled down her window, put the bag in the bank drop, uh, and drove away. She didn't get a receipt or, or anything. That was just the policy uh, that they had. Well, the next day when she got to work, uh, the manager said, hey, uh, do you still have the bag? Did you not get a chance to drop it off? And Amy said, no, I dropped it off. And uh, the manager said, well, the bank doesn't have it. So the police were called. Uh, They looked at at Amy. They looked at the bank, uh, at the store manager. Uh, They looked at the teller at the bank. Uh, They investigated. They looked for evidence. and, And they couldn't find the bag or any trace of the bag. They looked at Amy's bank account. There was nothing there. They they searched her car. Uh, they looked at the teller, but there was a, a video camera that, that uh, s- seemed to indicate that the teller didn't take the money. The manager uh, and Amy had counted it, so they both had signed it. Amy even admitted that she took the bag, uh, but that she put it in the bank drop uh, and uh, doesn't know what happened to it after that. Well, since there was no uh, a bag and there, were no, there was no money in anybody's account, this investigation sort of lingered for weeks. And that's where the struggle came in because we were fearful of what would happen if Amy had stolen the money. I mean, that was a big deal of what would happen, but she, she swore that she didn't steal the money. Uh, and so we wanted to believe, we tried to believe, but that's where faith and, and fear just clash and, and, uh, and fight against each other, don't they? You want to believe the best, but evidence and, and uh, things around you seem to point point you in the direction of fear. And so I think that's what Jesus is getting at, that it's this decision. We have to decide to be faithful 
people. It's not the, the most natural, easiest thing to do. Sometimes we have to fight against great urges. Well, after a number of weeks of just gut-wrenching, what's going to happen today? What's going to turn up? Uh, the maintenance workers came to the bank, and they were doing maintenance on all the machines, and they found that the bank bag was underneath the lid. When the drawer comes out, the lid is supposed to come down, but it got stuck, I guess. Amy put the bank bag in the slot like she was supposed to, but it was under the lid. And, and so when people looked for it, they just looked for it in the the section that it was supposed to be in, in the bank drawer, and it wasn't there, but the maintenance folks found the bag. Weeks later, all the money was there, everything that was supposed to, uh, and Amy was exonerated. She was telling the truth. There was just this mechanical issue. So sometimes faith is a hard thing. Sometimes fear just grips us and runs away with us. Well, Jesus asks us to have faith to trust, to believe. Sales folks will tell you that most of us operate either out of a fear of loss or a hope of gain. And that as salespeople, you have to figure out how people are operating and then you play to that. You either play to the hope or you play to the fear. Well, the Bible constantly asks us to have faith and to not fear, to not live our lives based on fear, to not run from everything, to not be afraid of everything, but to look uh, to to Jesus and to God for guidance and direction uh, and uh, to walk and live in that kind of hope. In fact, if you look at Jesus' ministry and the things that he says, his whole ministry is hope of gain based. It's not fear-based at all, even though a lot of preaching uh, around the world is fear-based. If you don't do this, God's going to get you. A lot of us live in fear of of a God that's angry at us and is going to get us. But look at what Jesus says. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will fall into place. That's based on a hope of gain. Come and follow. Again, based on hope of what's going to happen. I will make you fishers of men, Jesus says to the disciples. That's based on hope, a hope of gain. Don't fear, Jesus says. I am the light of the world. The story of the prodigal son are all hope-based. That God is active. God is working. Uh, I am the good shepherd. Turn the other cheek. The feeding of the 5,000 are all stories and sayings that are based in hope. Even in the Old Testament, the stories that we hang our hat on, David and Goliath is a hope-filled story. The story of Abraham and his call and his travels and his life and his his, uh, family is all based on a hope and a promise, a covenant that Abraham has with God. The story of Gideon is a story based on hope. The story of Moses leading the Israelites out of uh, Egypt and to the promised land is a hope of gain when we get to this promised land. Now, there's no doubt that fear sells. A whole lot of people profit from fear. It's sad to see that religion is at the top of that list because Jesus is telling us not to base our lives on fear, not to base our whole existence and the way we do things and the way we think about life based on a fear of loss. Don't, he says, let that be your motivation. Jesus invites us and Jairus to let hope win out over fear. Even when we experience failure, even when we experience loss, don't give up or give in. And so we see as this story progresses, Jairus uh, follows Jesus. Jesus is continuing to bolster him up, support him, help him continue to have this this hope, Um, and, and to not give in to the fear. Well, one of the most powerful scenes in all of the Bible is, is in Genesis chapter 4, verse 5 and 7, where Cain has discovered that his offering to God has not been as acceptable as his brother Abel's offering to God. And Cain is angry. 
And so uh, God comes and sits down with Cain and says, why are you angry? If you do well, things will go well for you. But if you do not do well, sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you, and you must master it. That, that's really the call uh, throughout our life is this struggle. Are we going to choose to live into the hope of our faith, or are we going to succumb to the temptation of fear? Our fear of loss can cause a spiral downward, and that's exactly what happens to Cain. Well, what's your motivation? Is it a fear of loss? Is it a hope of gain? Does it depend on the situation? Jesus is nudging us, encouraging us, helping us, even walking on the path with us, sitting in the boat with us, to help us live a life of hope and of trust and of belief. You know, at, 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 at this point in the sermon, I'm reminded of a poem that's attributed to Mother Teresa. And it seems to capture the practical way that we go about living a life of hope. Remember it with me. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you were kind, People may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some f- false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. But be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building someone could destroy overnight, build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, people may be jealous, but be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. But give the world the best you have anyway. For you see in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Let us pray. God, the temptation uh, today to fall into fear, to listen to all the, the social media news and uh, all the chatter and the commotion of the world around us is, is huge. And so many people are fearful and so many folks are selling us something to help us not be so much afraid. And, and, uh, and it's easy to fall into that trap. We hear Jesus' words, uh, don't be afraid, uh, only believe. Don't be afraid, follow me. Don't be afraid, come this way. And God, we recognize that that that's out of the mainstream around us. We ask for your help, for your guidance. I pray this morning, especially for folks that are are stuck in a place of fear. Uh, Maybe it's because the the fear is, is just so real and so present and it's so hard to find anything to be hopeful for. As Jairus walked with Jesus, uh, there wasn't much to be hopeful for as he thought about his daughter. But he, he, he continued to walk. God, give us strength to continue to walk, to continue to strive, to continue uh, to, to find ways of trust and belief, even in the midst of storms, even in the midst of battles, even in the midst of disease and peril. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock.
and 1115 AM. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at RUMC.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at RUMC.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at RUMC.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.